I want to talk about protein from my perspective, and I'm not that kind of doctor, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'm not giving dietary advice or medical advice, but this is some information that I have based on my background. And, you know, I, I have no disclosures by my understanding, but it's fair to know for you that I'm an advocate for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction in rumen and animal agriculture. Uh, I've worked in forage agriculture for most of my adult life, and I presently work for a forage seed company, but I'm not here as a representative of them, nor are they paying me to be here. I'm here on my own, like many people are, and I thank everyone for coming. Um, you know, thank you, Doug and Pam, for putting up with what you've had to put up with over the last several months. Um, and it's a real pleasure and honor to be here as part of this conference, especially when you're coming from my background, because there's sometimes I just look around and go, how the heck did this happen? Um, well, part of what happened was my own personal experience, like many of us, that got us here. You could call mine a Christmas story, right? 2007, set the camera up on the tripod, hit the timer, get in, you know, and then, ooh, what's wrong with the camera, right? I was a 51-year-old balding obese pre-diabetic. Three years later, and today, I'm still balding. <laughs> Dang it. But my last blood work, which was in July, was I had a four point something on my insulin and 82 glucose, uh, 64 HDL, 65 trig. Now, I'm not that kind of doctor, but I think that's doing pretty good for a guy that just was just about to turn 65. I'll take it. No medication other than thyroid medication, which is another issue. And I am an advocate for this miracle of creation, which you're called ruminants. They do so many wonderful, essential things for us. And I'd really like to get some more of these deployed around. But um, I think that would be worth watching, wouldn't it? That would make for a news conference. Um, or even a meeting of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. Um, and yeah, I'm an advocate for what I would consider a keto-sufficient diet. I, I like that idea, that the standard American diet is in fact keto-deficient. That's a nice way to look at it. Um, but I'm really tired of the us and them, although I lapse, you know, I'm only human. So if I cause offense, please forgive me, I don't mean to. My sincere interest is to help people along their journey by making sure that they have information that is available, but if you're not trained in those areas, why would you even know about it, right? So I want to make sure that people have information so they can make more informed decisions about their own lives, okay? Because there are consequences. <laughs> And I'm reasonably certain that most people don't have the information they think they have to make the, what they think are informed decisions. Good? Okay. But I'm fully on your side. Let's, let's make clear that. Um, I'm fully in favor of the therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. Um, it's important for people to understand that all protein isn't created equal. This didn't strike me as a particularly earth-shattering statement. Um, and folks are really interested in protein. You can hear all kinds of buzz about it in various places. Um, and that's completely appropriate, being monogastrics. We have to consume the indispensable amino acids that our bodies are not capable of making. Now, ruminants, on the other hand, one of their great virtues is they can take non-protein nitrogen and make all of the essential amino acids that we need, okay? But I'm convinced from experience that protein as a concept is pretty misunderstood. I should say, and forgive me for diving right in, just a little nerves, sorry, um, 6.15 tonight in Harborside, 
for all those topics related to animal agriculture or ruminant animal agriculture or other topics that I've spoken on in other places, come to Harborside, we can have a conversation. Okay, but time is pressing and this is enough for me to try to uh, get through. Um, so, and also on my social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, I have posted uh, links to a PDF, links to a folder with all these slides as single JPEGs, and a list of references for the talk that I'm giving. So um, I just want to share and help everybody understand or correct me, whatever is appropriate. Um, but these misunderstandings then, I am convinced, have manifest themselves through dietary advice, personal advice for health, and I know for sure that they manifest themselves in environmental conversations. Okay, so we need to get this sorted. Um, because frankly, as bad as things are in the high-income countries, it is bad globally, low, middle, high-income countries. And, and this is the shame and the scandal that we need to sort out. And here you see a phrase, protein energy malnutrition. And this is something from the literature for people that are working in these areas. And again, unfortunately, sometimes those conversations are contaminated with the conventional wisdom. And so I think we've got a two-way learning process that needs to take place. Um, you know, close to one billion, that's an underestimate. I mean, we got two billion people in the world that are either calorically deficit or then we've got, what, 2.2 billion people in the world that are overweight or obese? That's malnutrition. And that's protein energy malnutrition. But again, these people haven't been trained to think of it that way. We got to help them. Uh, children under five, half are deficient in micronutrients like iron, vitamin A, zinc. Uh, others, nearly a quarter are stunted. Nearly a quarter of children globally, five years or under, are stunted. This is not just stature, this is cognitive development. And they cannot recover from that throughout their lifetime. That's a lifetime decrement. That has an economic cost. It has an environmental cost. We're not good at looking at those things. At the same time, 7% are wasted. In other words, they're too, they don't weigh, have appropriate weight for their height. So, you know, typically the image of famine and caloric insufficiency, at the same time, 6% are overweight. So we have this mixed burden of malnutrition taking place globally, not only in high-income countries. So it's really important for some of the ideas that we're really comfortable with in this community to sort of break out into some of these other communities. And so there's some key differences that I think we know, but maybe we should review them. So we understand that isocaloric quantities of plant and animal foods are not isometabolic, right? Come on, I'm so tired of Zoom where there's no feedback. <laughs> Bye, crikey, now that I got a live audience. Right, because energy from plants is what? Sugar, starch, energy from animal source foods is what? It's fat, yummy. We'll get to protein in a second, I've heard some. Uh, if I could somehow provide isometric quantities of protein and minerals from plants and animals, those are not going to evoke the same metabolic response in humans, right? Okay. And then there's this kicker, <laughs> that the vitamin requirement we have seems to be influenced by where our energy and protein's coming from, right? So that's not a fixed amount. And too often, all three of these are not included in the calculations about global food security and systems and status. So my objection, uh, my objections, <laughs> my objectives today are in part to 
explain the difference between crude protein and true protein. The current status of humanity's protein supply and future demand, safe levels of dietary protein intake, methods of protein quality estimation, processing's effect and how that differs between plant sources and animal sources. I want to get us talking about protein and animal source foods beyond protein. So animal source foods provide protein plus. Uh, as well as the environmental footprints. Yeah, it's a lot, let's see how well we do. So first thing, crude protein is not true protein. Crude protein, in fact, is calculated by first determining the percent nitrogen in a sample. We then multiply that percent nitrogen figure by 6.25. That gives us a value we call crude protein because we assume that all the nitrogen that was in that sample was in protein, and all that protein was 16% nitrogen. But some proteins contain more or less than 16% nitrogen, so it's an approximation. Different foodstuffs contain varying amounts of non-protein nitrogen. So if you're eating dark green leafy vegetables, that have a significant amount of nitrate, that nitrate in a crude protein analysis is converted into protein. If we look at potatoes, for example, as much as a quarter of the protein listed for potatoes is in fact from non-protein nitrogen. Humans, other monogastrics cannot utilize that. And the difference between crude protein and true protein is going to be greater in our plant source foods. True protein from animal source foods contains higher proportion of the nutritionally essential amino acids than the plant source foods. Pretty basic stuff. Is this new information to anyone? Everybody, this is all tracking? Well, I've explained this to some fairly intelligent people that when you look at a food label and it says protein, or in a food table, or in your tracker, or when you're tracking your macros, that's not protein. And I get this look from some. <laughs> and these are intelligent people. So maybe it's worth repeating it, right? For those who are already familiar, I'm sorry, other people. And then we have to start digging a little deeper. RDA, recommended daily allowance for protein. Too many people think it's a target, when in fact it's a minimum. Too many people think that all protein goes into that amount and counts against it. In fact, their definition says it's a reference protein. Now, because we've been playing so many games with worldviews and narratives, you gotta dig a couple layers down into the footnotes to see that reference protein to them means high quality. That means meat, eggs, dairy, seafood. So if you're not getting your protein from meat, eggs, dairy, seafood, you need more in order to get to the minimum. Hadn't really changed much in 70 years. Might be time for an update. What do you think? Anything else changed over the last 70 years? So now we can take a step and look at what's going on globally. And now here's some data, FAO stat, comparing 1961 to 2013 amounts for different regions of the world. First, bottom of the bars is animal source protein. This is grams of protein. And there's the plant on top of it. And now, whoops, sorry, back. Does back work? There it is. So you can see we, we have varying amounts across different regions. Good news is that since 20, 1961, more protein is available. We've also increased humanity, right? So we're, we're providing more and individuals have access to more. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna clean it up a little bit, just focus on the 2013 data. 
same format, but notice I'm making it a point. This is crude protein. Right? Notice before they just had it labeled protein. Okay, got to watch them. Okay. And so here's your 0.8 grams per kilogram of reference protein. But some people look at this and go, oh, look, we're exceeding the protein requirements in every region of the world. Protein isn't a nutrient of concern. Really? Well, let's continue. In fact, we have data that suggests that maybe the target is set too low, or it's not a target, as I said, RDA is a minimum. Maybe we ought to be shooting for 1.2 to 1.6 grams of high quality protein per kilogram body weight. Same data, everything's the same, except I had to expand the vertical axis. Because if you try to calculate protein intake on a percent of calories like they do in the acceptable macronutrient distribution range from 10 to 25 percent of calories, then that's the range that you would see extending from essentially our, the, the minimum up to 202 grams for a 70 kilogram individual. But the good news is we have a great deal of safety <laughs> in terms of the potential intake for this. Tolerable upper level at 3.5 grams per kilogram body weight. And yes, it's grams of body weight, not lean body mass. And you need to pay attention to that in the literature because they switch that around and make it more confusing. Or ideal body weight is another way they express it. And it's like, good luck finding that, <laughs> right? Bad enough to just go off body weight. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> I can't help myself. <sighs> this is where some would have us ingesting protein. I don't think so. Okay, back to the crude protein supply globally. Now we're looking at the average across the globe, and we know that this is going to vary tremendously, but this is where we are. So if anybody says that we should be eating plant-based diets, we already are. Maybe that's the problem. But I digest. So humanity gets less of its protein supply from all animal source foods combined than it does from cereals. And wheat is the single largest source of crude protein in humanity's diet. I'm certain that's the problem. So this paper just came out in 21. Again, we're looking at the same exercise where we've got the, the, the Animal, the plant source is the green bar now on the bottom, and the animal is the peach color on the top. Um, and this is looking at 103 countries and territories that qualify in the low and middle income. Okay? And some people look at this and they see that average daily protein requirement line, and they say, well, look at how many are exceeding it. Therefore, protein is not a nutrient of concern. These authors took it a little bit deeper. They said, okay, first of all, whoop, let's adjust it for digestibility. Yeah, that's a good idea. Just because it's there doesn't mean we can absorb it, right? Thank you. So just doing that one adjustment, look at how it changes the picture. And now because the amount of protein we can utilize is limited by the limiting nutrient, a limiting amino acid, I'm sorry, this is how much they could utilize. And now none of those 103 countries are meeting their protein requirements. Changes the picture completely. And this is a reality for a substantial portion of the globe. 
But understand, an eight-year-old boy physically couldn't eat enough rice and lentils if he had unlimited access. Physically couldn't eat enough to meet his lysine requirements. We've got some narratives that have been part of this conventional wisdom for a long time, and they need to be rooted out. But like, you know, Bermuda grass or Johnson grass, it's got runners and roots that extend a long way, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us. But don't think that this is something that only pertains in the low- and middle-income countries. This is from, remarkably enough, the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report. And from these data, they stated that protein was not a nutrient of concern, that is, too little, in the American diet. Let me explain what's going on here. We've got different age groups here. We've got females and males. Um, or, sorry, we've got excess. We've got... Um, Below recommendations, above recommendations, that's the split on either side of the center line. And males, females by different age groups, and 40 over 40% of Americans in 2015 weren't getting enough protein. And this is crude protein. And this is based on an RDA of 0.8 grams per kilogram. So they're shooting at a low target, and they're overinflating the value of the protein that's being consumed. And most females over the age of eight aren't getting enough protein in the United States. Take home messages. Intake targets should be based on a specific amount of high quality protein based upon individual considerations. Once again, I'm not that kind of doctor. I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So find one, find what works. Maybe we're back in the, you know, still in the personal exploration phase to find what works. There are guidelines. We should follow them. Um, but they should not be on a percent of calories basis. That makes sense? We need a specific amount, regardless of how many calories we consume during the day. And oh, by the way, it's virtually impossible to <laughs> estimate or measure or whatever the calories we're consuming. And then again, crude protein overestimates the protein content of plant source foods. So if that's the, pr the primary part of your diet, then you need to adjust that upwards in order to make sure you're getting sufficient. And you need to pay attention to the indispensable amino acids that are provided by what you're eating. Again, different categories. Some of these are now in flux within the science. People are arguing about whether these classical terms are even appropriate anymore. Um, that you know, just because we can make some amino acids doesn't mean that we can make enough of them under certain conditions, and especially if we start concocting really bizarre diets or food-like substances that then become the basis of the diet. This is, this is where it starts to cross over into what I'm more familiar and comfortable with. Um, animal nutrition is a functional scientific discipline. All right, there's test, there's evaluation. At the end of the day, <laughs> we don't blame the cow if the production doesn't match what the nutritionist said it should be. Nutritionists get fired every single day in animal agriculture. We have hard endpoints. We can make a value, and so for almost half a century, swine nutritionists have been balancing their rations on an individual indispensable amino acid basis, which, by the way, <laughs> has been the recommendation of the FAO since 2013. They've also recommended that individual indispensable amino acids be listed on food labels as individual nutrients. Haven't seen a lot of progress on that. If your name happens to be Hill, 
and, and this young man happens to be your relative, I only use it as an example. Um, there's a mnemonic for learning this in animal science and animal nutrition. Uh, private Tim Hill, phenylalanine, valine, threonine is the private. Tryptophan, isoleucine, methionine is the Tim. And histidine, leucine, and lysine is the hill. So this is how we teach our undergraduates to remember the indispensable amino acids. I've used a figure that's Liebig's barrel before to, to make the point that I believe that hyperinsulinemia is the short stave that is the greatest insult to public health today. And that you can futz about with the other staves, but you're not going to hold any more water until you raise that short stave. These people are using the same analogy, but with those indispensable amino acids. Again, protein value depends on the first limiting amino acid, which determines how much of all the other amino acids can be absorbed and utilized. This is a big deal in animal agriculture because if you don't have the right balance, you're going to be excreting more nitrogen, which is then an environmental issue you're also not going to be getting efficient use of the feed and the necessary performance from the animals. So in this case, when you had lysine that was limiting, you raise lysine, and now one of these other threonine in this case becomes, or still lysine, right? You could bump it up a little bit more, but then the threonine is going to be the limiting amino acid. What happens when we feed swine a lysine deficient diet. Well, across these studies, they saw 19% more subcutaneous fat. They saw 89% more intramuscular fat, that's marbling, and 8% smaller loin eye area, muscle wasting. That's the difference between two and five on the marbling scale for pork. And individuals in those disciplines refer to this as metabolic syndrome. That's interesting. We've used something called PDCAS for a few years, Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score, um, which has always had a few limitations which were always known, but it's one of those things where we're limited by funding or technology or what have you. Um, it overestimated the digestibility of plant source protein and underestimated through truncation the value of the animal source foods. Um, and it also had really limited estimating ability for bioavailability. So as I mentioned before, about 2013, World uh, Health Experts, WHO, uh, expert panel, very good, waiting for that, um, got together and made the recommendation that we need to move to something called digestible indispensable amino acid score. This is something that will rely on pig ileal samples rather than rat fecal samples to determine digestibility. And if you understand the terms, you already understand some of the difficulty involved. This gets more and more expensive, but it's a very complicated thing, and we can no longer rely on micro to give us percent nitrogen and just do the math in a spreadsheet. Um, individual amino acids are looked at in dias as opposed to crude protein, which is what's used in PDCAS. Um, there are three scoring patterns based on stage of life. In dias, there's one in PDCAS, and again, I mentioned there's no truncation. Uh, all of the animal source foods that had values over 100 in PDCAS were capped at 100. So there was no ability for an animal source food to complement lower quality plant source foods in the diet. Now with DIAS, we have that ability. I uh, won't spend a lot of time going through. You, I welcome and encourage you to look at the slides um, or the presentation to see this for more detail if you'd like, but let's just look at practical application. I think that if you look at this list of protein foods, most of those would fit in someone's 
understanding of a good protein source, yes? Well, even by PD cas, the almonds, the sunflower seeds, and the peanut butter don't qualify as a good protein source. And when we go to dias, only the chickpeas qualify. That could make a difference. And here's something that really knocked me over when I first realized it. In forage agronomy, we've spent years teaching farmers to test individual lots of hay. So a lot would be one cutting from one field in a year, for example, as so long as that field is the same planting. And we teach them how to do that so it's a representative sample, and we teach them how to send that sample to an accredited laboratory so that they can get because the nutritive value varies so much. That's true for all plant source foods. They're far more variable in their nutrient content than animal source foods by nature. We sort of had this control process in place with the animal, right? Make sense? Thank you. God, I hate Zoom. <sighs> So in one database of almost 6,000 soybeans, the value for crude protein varied by 20% plus and minus around the, the mean. Individual amino acids could vary by 45%. I'm pretty sure that they don't print a new label for every batch of soybeans that rolls in. And when you look at a food table, that's some kind of an average value, yes? And a good table will tell you how many observations went into it. In some parts of the world, some of the foods aren't even listed or there's only one observation. It, the really limited value, uh, values and data uh, available even today. Um, again, I mentioned that wheat was the primary protein source for humanity, but even it can vary from 9 to 15% depending on the market class. Different market classes of wheat have a different protein content, intentionally. And then you've got differences in management and year and all that kind of stuff. So this can vary quite a bit, yet we're saying, oh, there's so much wheat times some value, that's the protein we're getting from wheat. Mm, might want to look at that. But wheat, as I mentioned before, is a really poor source of protein for humans. Okay, the dias value for children, I mean, less than 40%, it's, it's, it's not, it will only meet 40%, less than 40% of the needs, right, as a single source. Yeah, okay, you're not going to mac on wheat berries if you're, you know, between birth and six months. You get marginally better as we grow older. Okay, fine, so, you know, whopping 54% once we get up above three years. But then we make it worse when we process it. Like I say, we don't just go like munching wheat berries, right? We make it into bread, we make it into breakfast cereal, and we drive that value down. Because all this processing inactivates, makes unavailable the lysine, which is already the limiting nutrient. And so we make whole wheat bread, we cut that value in half, we make it into a corn-based kind of breakfast cereal and virtually nothing as far as protein. Now imagine that instead of putting real milk on that cereal, somebody starts putting plant juice. <laughs> Doesn't happen with animal source foods. If you overcook a steak, yes, you will drive that value below 100. It will no longer be an excellent source of protein, and you should be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> but the marvelous thing is, I can take a pork belly and make bacon out of it and make it better <laughs> nutritionally. Obviously, it's better. I mean, it's bacon. We increase the protein digestibility when we make the dreaded processed meats. So here we can take a lower value, you know, like the trim off beef, 
or pork when we make charcuterie, which is a fancier way of saying lunch meat. And we can actually increase it when we make bologna out of it or ferment it to make salami. We improve its nutritive value. I'd say that's good news. Uh, again, I, I mentioned earlier, um, the, it, there's this interesting observation now that perhaps some part of what we're seeing as this, I'm sorry, pandemic of metabolic illness is some manifestation of a deficiency of indispensable amino acids. I'm going to go over this pretty quickly. Um, for time, but that last bullet, subclinical quasiorcor, is something to think about. Quasiorcor is a word that I've been told means what happens to the baby when the new baby comes. Now think about it. You've got a mother breastfeeding a child. The next baby comes. That baby's displaced onto cereal. And then you see the essential amino acid deficiencies show up. And you can see all kinds of, you know, graphics talking about signs and symptoms of protein deficiency. Um, actually, maybe it's just my mind, but I wasn't certain what they meant by these images at first. <laughs> so it's not just me. Good. Okay. Um, but we need to stop talking about it as protein. We need to get more specific. This is a deficiency of our indispensable amino acids. Now, the meat industry has positioned itself for a number of reasons that I can understand as the protein industry. But I don't think that's a winning strategy now. I think we need to broaden that out and look at all of the nutrients that we get from animal source foods. But all of that stuff that I've just went through is a lot to put on somebody, right? In some cases, the information isn't even available to the consumer. Better to just say, whatever animal source food is appropriate to you, is affordable to you, is available to you, enjoy that as part of your meals. Or make it your entire meal, whatever. Right? But animal source food is essential, especially when we're talking about pregnant women, nursing women, developing children, and then later in life. So when we start looking at these highly processed things that come in, that becomes a question that I start to go, wait a minute, you know, we know that processing will influence the nutritive value from a human perspective. And we know that animal source foods provide these unique and essential nutrients. Sometimes they're the sole source, sometimes they're the best source. But if you're going to remove all animal source food from the diet, then we've got a bigger job. And when we start from a nutritive sense, depending on a lower quality diet, we end up consuming more carbohydrates to make up for it. And that's that protein to energy balance that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. I'm asking the question of everyone I can, is there such thing as too little animal source food in the human diet? Well, yes. Um, there's evidence of what happens when people by circumstances are forced to consume low quality grain-based diets. The first thousand days, we've got a third of women of childbearing age being anemic globally. B12 deficiency is widespread even in the United States. Only 40% of infants six months or less, I was about to say six years, six months or less are exclusively breastfed. And this is again where you kind of see the narrative coming in in this WHO document. We have them making the statement that animal source foods are the best sources of high quality nutrients for children six to 23 months of age. Hello, Dr. Noakes. But the WHO said it. 
but they said it a couple footnotes down. It wasn't up in the text. Why would you do that? Okay, moving along. Unfortunately, 59% of children in that age group are not fed eggs, dairy, fish, or meat. This is globally. That's a shame. That's a scandal. We can, we must do better. This is the relationship between the consumption of meat of various kinds uh, and the degree of stunting in these various countries. And just you know, association doesn't prove causation, but I'm willing to go with it, and I'm certainly not willing to follow the Eat Lancet recommendations. Seems to me like that's taking us in the wrong direction. Remember, stunting isn't merely stature. It is preventing that human being from achieving its full potential. And stunting isn't just from a lack of animal source food. It can be from poor harvest or poor storage conditions for cereals, pulses, and nuts that develop aflatoxin contamination. There have been studies done demonstrating the efficacy of really modest in interventions in school children. So now we're, we've gone beyond the infant now. Now we're looking at school children. And just an egg a day. Small amount of animal source food to supplement their traditional local diet. And they can document cognitive and scholastic differences in the children that receive those interventions. And when you get to be an old fart like me, you've already heard it that we need more high quality protein in our diet than someone who's in their 20s or 30s, right? So when it comes to the consumption of animal source food, there is such a thing as too little. Is there really such a thing as too much? You hear this all the time. I do. I'll sit in these meetings where people are talking about sustainable livestock systems in Africa or in Asia or globally, and they'll say, we need more animal source food available to people in those parts of the country, but those Westerners are consuming too much. What does that look like? What do they think health-wise comes from too much animal source food? I'm here to say the preponderance of high quality evidence as opposed to nutritional epidemiology of chronic diseases from all scientific disciplines strongly suggests that the most likely harm associated with animal source food consumption is, is from not consuming enough. And when we start to factor in the quality of these different foods, the environmental impact gets dramatically reduced. Again, back to this paper by Moen, and you can see from left to right, what happens when you correct from total protein to digestible lysine. These differences all of a sudden either reverse in some cases or they go away. Cattle in the United States produce more, 240% more human edible lysine than they consume in corn over their lifetime. They're tremendous upcyclers. Again, the food that goes in, the food that comes out, the food that comes out is much more valuable. So in any conversation about feed versus food, we have to account for that. We too often don't. Um, I, I know I'm getting late. Um, this is a, a paper in process and trying to account for nutrients beyond protein, beyond the essential amino acids, as important as those are. And you can see the vast difference in greenhouse gas emissions if you were to try to meet those nutrients from refined grains or even the healthy whole grains up here versus liver or eggs or cow milk or pork or even beef. And here's the kicker for all of this. In the latest IPCC report that just came out, they admit that they've been using the wrong metric 
to estimate the impact of enteric methane on the environment. They're only off between three and four times, so it's, it's fine, really. So, blitz through a lot, I'm over time. Uh, I, I'm not that kind of doctor, right? But I want to make sure that everybody takes their daily meds. A steak a day keeps the doctor away. Again, I hope I've achieved these objectives. And how would a consumer know how to adjust from basically an omnivorous diet, right? If they're going to start removing animal source foods, how would they know what they need to do to ensure that they get the sufficient essential nutrition that they must have? Whenever you start reading stuff about protein energy ratios, you got to know what they're measuring and reporting. This happens with environmental impacts as well. Models, what are they predicting? The policy questions, you know, why, why are they not applying the available science? So, uh, you have been very patient and you've participated, which is good, which is good. I, I really, really appreciate that. It's great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Once again, 6.15 tonight, Harborside. Um, a chance for maybe, a, you know, definitely more interactive on broader topics than this. And I'm here until Monday morning when I fly home. Um, so please feel free to come up and talk to me. I have cards on the back table. These are my social media accounts. I welcome interaction, correction, contributions. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks again for supporting Low Carb USA. Could you go back to the slide where you talked about um, almonds, sunflower seeds, peanut butter with one um, way of looking at protein and then another way of looking at protein? Um, living in San Diego, mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends that are vegetarians, um, vegans, um, and don't Those eat. are not the same thing. Uh, yeah, I'm well aware. <laughs> right, but no, I think it's an... I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think it's really important because my understanding of vegetarian is they're an omnivore that doesn't eat red meat. Even, even in India, where they don't, may not eat beef, they do eat animal source foods. So, I, you know, that's again where I think the language might need a little sharpening up, but please go ahead. Yes, so when our uh, vegan friends um, are eating the stuff they eat that we don't eat. Um, one of the things that often comes up is peas. And I was not able to process your entire slide um, as fast as you went through it. And so I wanted to see um, about pea and protein. Um, I got the nuts, I got the um, beans, um, and only chickpeas, but I wasn't sure um, about peas. OK. It's, it's soon. I'm almost there. There we go. We're I'm there. almost there. God, he had a lot of slides. Okay. There we go. Here we go. So, um, peas are not on there. The, the, I mean, you've got yellow peas up here, which are a close. Um, and I do have some references listed that cite um, pea protein extract, which is of interest in one of the faux burger, you know, the plant puck uh, products. And. <laughs> And that actually is a pretty low quality. It's just borderline for being called a good protein. You put it on a wheat bun and it no longer is, right? So it, it, that, that would be my answer for that. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you, I really enjoyed your talk and I've listened to numerous podcasts. Um, I've gone so far down this rabbit hole that I'm starting to raise my own grass-fed beef. Um, and, uh, but I'm a complete neophyte, but um, ruminants are amazing. And uh, 
how careful do I have to be about the quality of my pasture, or if I wait long enough, will the beef get to where they need to be? You were talking about the differences in the uh, you know, sources of the forage and the grain, but I'm just hoping the cows will sort it all out. <laughs> Hope is not a plan. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it is more challenging to produce high quality, consistent grass-fed beef than it is from the more conventional commercial approach, which is one reason why we have the commercial conventional approach. So one of the problems that you will face is if you cannot provide a consistently high quality forage to them during their growth phase, it's gonna take them longer. You're gonna have meat that some would find to be less desirable because of tenderness or flavor, uh, other sort of sensory things. But um, no, we can talk about forage agronomy. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to help with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good luck. Hi, thank you. I'm not sure you can answer this, but for young women, um, especially you know, in their, in their 20s that all want to be vegetarian because that's what they're told they're supposed to be, what would be your advice on how to counsel them in terms of, of um, you know, the, the long-term consequences? Because they're not feeling the consequences now because they're young and their bodies work really great. Mm -hmm. Well, so I have no children. That makes me an expert. Um, <laughs> um, I would... When I think back to what I was like in high school, wasn't that a lyric? Um, you know, you can't tell me anything, really. Tell me what to do, and I'll go the other direction. I don't think I was that unique. Um, but having a conversation about the nutrients that young women need in order for them to be reproductively healthy and to develop in a healthful, healthy way, setting themselves up for a, a healthy adulthood. Um, because now we're seeing this evidence that some of the stuff that happens actually in utero, in, in livestock agriculture we call it fetal programming. Uh, in our community here we, we call it uh, what, 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 epigenetics, that's what we call it. Uh, same thing. So the, 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 the nutritional status of the dam or the mother is going to have an impact on her daughter or son as they grow after birth. Back to your question, I don't know because there's so many things coming against. I think one of the most important things, and I heard it from a completely different way, was just basically to affirm our children as being smart and being attractive and you know being special as they are. And, and try to protect them from the nonsense images that are being foisted on them through any number of channels, and good luck with that, because I have no idea how to do that. But I, I heard once that the budget for the photoshopping for the cover was more than they paid the model to pose for the picture. You know, so our fashion stuff is so artificial, and, and I can't think that that's helpful. And then I think that, okay, this is something, the, this message of a dietary solution to your personal image, it, you know, maybe those aren't as separate as we maybe tr try to treat them at times. That, I'm sorry, I just, all I can do is make sure that parents have access to the information that you know, I've blasted through here or others have available to them. Thank you. Bill Gates doesn't help. <laughs> Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. I have a question about bioavailability of all the micronutrients. Um, can you get everything from meat and fish and chicken? Can you get vitamin C? Or does that have to come from plant material? Yeah, 
good, great question. I, th I have been known to say in public that if you can't get it from animal source food, you don't need it. Okay, so that would include fiber, that would include vitamin C, and people, I, I would refer people to work by folks like Amber O'Hearn, who's covered in greater depth than I could what's going on with vitamin C, because it may be that certainly a diet higher in carbohydrate increases your requirement for vitamin C. And, and she made the points in some of her presentations that going way back, it was known that one of the things that cured scurvy was fresh meat. Oh. And again, back to the test results, when you look up in a food table, in a really good food table, when they put zero for vitamin C in the meat, there should be an asterisk. And down in the footnote, it should say assumed to be zero. Not measured to be, assumed to be. So lots of these sort of confounders in the story, but again, then there are people that would point to um, people whose traditional diet was exclusively or almost exclusively animal source foods because of the environments that they were living in and they didn't have scurvy. So, you know, not a lot of citrus in the Arctic, and yet the Inuit didn't have scurvy. So those sorts of things are what I'd you know, start the conversation on, but I'm not the best person to cover that topic. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, you said something extremely controversial, I'm sure, and just, you went... Just one thing? Well, this, <laughs> this, should have just, this should have gotten us all up rioting. You said that it's almost impossible for an individual to count her or his calories correctly. And like, what have we been doing for 50 years? Yeah, a very good question. Can you? <laughs> well, so, quick question. How many calories per gram of carbohydrate? How many calories per gram of fat? How many calories per gram of protein? Those are all approximations. And it varies because we don't sit down and just have, well, <laughs> some of us do. Some sit down and have a bowl of carbohydrate, right? <laughs> but typically we eat a mixed diet that contains various proportions. Well, those various proportions influence how much caloric, you know, we take on, okay? Atwater has, there's, there's an extensive list of calorie values for foods, but we, again, boil it down to where it's four, nine, and four. And again, those are just approximations, so those can vary plus or minus a couple percent. And then you're left with, a, well, how much did I actually eat, right? And few of us, as Dave in, few of us actually carry a scale around with us and actually measure everything that we eat. And then where do you go for the value of what you just ate, right? Because if it's a mixed meal, what were the ingredients? I mean, I've tried, because I know that anal retentive is hyphenated, I've gone when I make a batch of something and try to figure out, well, there was so much of this and so much of that and so much of this other thing, now add it all up and now I'm going to parcel it out. And my wife is just going, I married an idiot. Um, <laughs> It's a hopeless, and, and then that's before we ever get to whether that's a viable model or not, right? right. That, yeah, so that's what I meant by that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. My name's Ron Ressler. I'm known as the bipolar carnivore. Uh, Dr. Sivas so coined it, and I'm not fat. This is a diastasis recto vertical hernia. My abs don't touch, so. Oh. The first thing you notice about me is this, right? My granddad, my brother, etc. I a specific question. I'm probably or undoubtedly the oldest in here. I'm 76. I come from... Anyone want to refute him? Anyone over 76? I'm the only one wearing a hat. Okay. And you might notice what it is. Kansas City Chiefs, they have a quarterback. Does anybody know the quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs? Mahomes. Mahomes. I'm working on Mahomes to join us. 
Oh, okay. My. He's a pretty influential young man. But my I come from the Blue Stem Hills of eastern Kansas, the best grazing in the world for 60 to 90 days. Just like feeding grain, only it's grass. Anyway, I have a friend, large cattleman, that feeds fermented grain from the alcohol factories or the ethanol. Right. And I believe you can feed that kind of grain and not knock out the grass-fed um, word or name. Is that, have you done any work with the fermented grains? Well, so uh, technically the distiller's grains yes. aren't, they, they are the, what's left over after as much carbohydrate has been converted to alcohol. Correct. So it's looked at as a protein feed at that point. Right. So it's not the same thing as, and, and <clears throat> that's a technical point that maybe only I'm interested in. By the standard, you can't feed that. Cannot? Cannot, because that's a grain byproduct. But it doesn't have the carbs in it. Well, I just said it was the standard. I didn't say it had to make sense. <laughs> So that, that's where that is. Now, okay. yeah, I would think that you are looking at a situation where because you're feeding it primarily for the protein, not so much for the rapidly fermentable carbohydrate, you're going to have a different reaction or effect on the fatty acids in the meat. Um, this, this man uh, comes out of Redding, Kansas. He's a well-educated chemical engineer, attorney, et cetera, et cetera. And he's interested in pursuing that line of thinking. Uh, my uh, card's on the back table. Be sure I to introduce us. I want to say a couple more things before I leave, and that is I have a source of free meat that I think... Whoa, free meat. Whoa, whoa, free meat. Wait, he said free meat. Go find the man. Um, yeah, sorry, but we have some questions still from the people in the live stream, and we've got a few minutes, so we need to get, we need to get them in. Pam? Yes, sorry, I'm just um, jumping in here. Um, Daniel Andrus says, just want to clarify, did you suggest lysine deficiency equals more internal fat accumulation? Is he correct? Yes. Lysine deficiency increases marbling or intramuscular fat deposition. Okay, thank you very much. I think that might be the only online question. Just anybody? We do have 10 minutes if you want to jump in and do a couple more, or we can actually take a break. You want, no, wait, hang on, hang on. Oh, Doug, better not say that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Peter. One, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one thing really quick. I want to thank you all and everyone who will be part of this because of what I've learned from you, I just pass on to other people, right? And so just recently, I got an early birthday present when one of my academic mentors sent me a message saying that despite his family history of diabetes, having lost a sibling already, for the last three years, every six months, his blood work comes back being normal. And his physician over three years ago had said, when I put you on medications, not if. And so what you are doing and sharing is reaching a wider audience. And if I can in any way, small way, repay that, please don't hesitate you can tell people that eating this way won't kill them. And maybe I can help you convince them that eating this way won't kill the planet. And maybe we can make some progress in this tragedy. Thank you.